All right, so we got a few <laughs> popping in here, still trickling in at the moment. Oh, keeps going up, keeps going up, keeps going up. I love it, I love to see it. So I get to look at you two guys the whole time. <laughs> I mean, I, I could stop my video. No, no, I, I don't really care. <laughs> All right, looks like we have slowed down with people joining in. Uh, so we are 512, two minutes past our start time. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So first and foremost, gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, or rather good evening. Uh, my name is Casey Herman. I'm a director of development for the Pike Foundation, which is the fundraising arm of PiCap Alpha. I am based in Dallas, Texas, and I engage alumni uh, and fundraise for the fraternity. Um, empowering principal leaders to shape a better tomorrow. That's why we're here, specifically why you are here during your Friday at five o'clock. Each of you, by being virtually present, have taken the next step and committed to being a leader on your campus and a future leader in the profession of your choosing. Truly learn how to lead. Just being exposed to the training isn't enough. It is uh, equally important to expose all of you to role models and mentors. To do this, the PiCap Alpha Foundation sponsors the Leadership Lecture Series, what we're doing right now, where we ask successful and prominent alumni to spend time with you, sharing inspiring lessons, principles, and stories so that you can learn from their experiences and use their practices to enhance your own life. And today, I have the pleasure to introduce to you a 1976 initiate of our Beta Mu chapter at the University of Texas, Austin, John Rathmel Jr. John currently serves as president of Lockton Marine and Energy, one of the nation's largest energy insurers. John was the finance chair for the Centennial House campaign that aimed to raise $5 million to provide the men of Beta Mu Chapter a state-of-the-art facility. The Chapter House at 2400 Leon Street in Austin was delivered by Beta Mu alumni and many others in August of 2020, marking Beta Mu's chapter's 100th consecutive year of operation. John, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the reins over to you. I'll be fielding questions. I encourage everyone here right now to please ask the questions through the Q&A box. Uh, I'll be monitor monitoring it, we'll be monitoring it, and let's, uh, let's interact tonight and end this on a good note. John? Thank you, KC. Thank you to all, uh, all of y'all for joining in. I'm sorry we're not together. I was talking to KC earlier that this would be so much more effective if I could walk around the room and look you in the eye and I'm, I'm looking you in my eye, but uh, hopefully one of these days I can do this, uh, do this in person. But uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about my career and, and, and more about really the philosophies and, and what were, was impactful to me that, that I think that I can share with you that would relate in, uh, and hopefully you'll, take a few things away from this thing uh, today, but this hour or so that we're gonna spend together is about you. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about, my basic principles you know, that I've learned are, are not, they're not rocket science, they're not new, they're, um, they're not silver bullets. Uh, and uh, that they're, they're easy to write down. And, uh, but I think the hard thing is, can you take away one that might resonate with you and put it into practice in, uh, in, your, in your life, your work, or whatever you, you do? That's the, that's the key. But I um, also want to say I'm not the smartest person in the room. I, um, I struggled at school. I found that I had to work harder than most people. Um, and uh, what I learned was through trial and error. Some people might learn it through you know, theory and all that. Mine was just the school of, of hard knocks. And um, the one, one of the founding principles I always lived by, my dad used to tell me is, uh, hard work's the great equalizer. And um, I'm gonna use that uh, in examples today. So let's, let's uh, take a quick walk through uh, who I am, my career, and then what we're gonna do is I'll circle back to uh, key events in my life and, and organizations that were impactful and, and use some of the philosophies that hopefully um, from there you can kind of use. So I, uh, John Rathmel, I grew up in Houston, Texas, uh, and uh, I uh, 
I've lived there pretty much my entire life, except for three years in London, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm married to a, a great woman from Oklahoma, uh, although she was, uh, she went to OU, and every year I have to go to the OU Texas game, and they've been kicking her ass, so that's a little bit of a problem in our family. So that's house divided on OU days, but um, besides that, she's great, and uh, I've got three kids, they're adults. Now, sometimes they don't act like adults, but they are um, two girls and a boy. I, uh, my education really started in, um, in Catholic, uh, Catholic schools and in St. Thomas in Houston is all boys Catholic school. It really made a big impact on me. It was sort of a fraternity in a way. Uh, and, and, uh, but it wasn't until I got to UT in, um, in 75, I graduated from St. Thomas in 75 and started UT in 75. And that's where I earned a, a, a degree in business and, uh, and graduated in 79. Obviously, I, I joined the Betty Venue chapter, chapter of Pike. And I'm gonna talk about that specifically after I get through this. Uh, 30 days after I uh, graduated uh, from University of Texas, I was uh, sitting in London, England on a cold, rainy night thinking, what the hell did I just do? Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. That's where I started my insurance career with a, uh, a very aggressive startup, uh, Lloyd's of London broker, um, and uh, had no idea what I was gonna get myself into. I was there for three years and um, I came back to Houston and started with a company by the name of Adams and Porter. Uh, at the age of 26 uh, and, um, and became a partner there at uh, the age of 28. It was a privately held insurance broker. Unfortunately, uh, when I was the year that I became partner, it, it sold. I'll never forget the day that one of the senior partners walked in and said, what do you think of Adams and Porter sold? And I was in a state of shock because everything was going so well, but um, that goes down to you uh, sometimes can't control things that happen in your career or life, uh, particularly if you don't own the business that you, uh, you're subject to uh, the vagaries of the way that the business goes, which is a, a, a big deal. And I always wanted to try to be in control of my, my, uh, myself uh, in, in that, in that uh, but um, I will say this, that, uh, I moved on, we, we were purchased by Aon, uh, or predecessor of Aon, you may have heard of them. They're the largest publicly traded broker in the world. And I never forget my dad's saying, you're gonna rue the day you ever work for a publicly traded company. And um, I kind of dismissed that comment at the time, but I, uh, I probably had developed a little bit more of appreciation for, for what he was trying to tell me, but, um, Eight years later, I was fortunate to have an opportunity to, I was approached by Lockton. Um, they didn't have an office in Houston. They wanted a, a person to start a marine energy team. I just happened to be ready to uh, leave. And um, I was one of the co-founders of, uh, of, of the Lockton office in Houston. And uh, we started, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later on, but we started with, uh, three people in the marine energy group, including me, uh, one office, which was Houston, and, uh, and I was able to pull over a million dollars in revenue. Uh, and that was the start of, of Lockton Marine Energy. Uh, today, Lockton is uh, five offices across, energy offices across the globe. Uh, the main two offices are Houston and London. And, um, we have uh, about 300 professionals that work in uh, marine energy, and we have a revenue of about 275 million. So it's it's been a good ride, and and I don't take responsibility for all of that. But it the seed started in Houston, Texas. Um, so that's a little bit of a a background. And now let's get into the let's get into the 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 things that will help you and what we really in, in, in foundational in my life uh, for, for how I, you know, progressed through my career and the decisions that had to be made. Um, and so I'm going to roll back to 
to Pi Kappa Alpha because I know it, it probably sounds like a setup, but when I think back on, on my career, there was no question uh, that when I got to the University of Texas and, and, and faithfully pledged Pike, that's another story that would probably take a little bit longer than, than we have today. But thank God I didn't pledge any of the fraternities that I was sort of destined to pledge coming out of Houston, Texas. And I pledged Pike Kappa Alpha, Beta Mu, Pike. Um, but in high school, I didn't have a distinguished career. I wasn't a great athlete. I never was in any organizations. I didn't lead anything. I didn't have any other organizations that I was really in. And it wasn't until I got into Pike that it, it really gave me a platform to, um, to explore myself. And um, one of the most important uh, things I, I, I started to learn is you got to start taking risk. And that's that's on one of my foundational principles. Prin principles you've got to you got to take risks. You got to get out of your com comfort zone. And so when I got into Pike, it would it was easy just to drink beer with the guys. But here were these folks taking positions in offices and being rush captains and presidents and social chairs. And well, oh, it was a lot of work. And well, let them do that. And then I said to myself, No, you know what? That's not right. Um, but I had to get elected and I got elected and I, so it gave me the organizational platform to, to run for office, get elected for office, have to understand what the responsibilities of that office were, uh, bylaws, parliamentary procedure, how to run a meeting, how to be an adult when you really wanted to be a kid. Uh, how to make difficult decisions um, with friends of yours when, uh, when, when we were challenged with some issues. Um, all of those things were, were really, I didn't understand how foundational that was. Um, and it was because I, I took some risk in, okay, maybe I'm going to have to do a little bit extra work. Maybe I have to spend a little bit more time. But um, another principle that came in that I learned is the more you give, the more you get. Okay. And that applies to work and that applies to uh, charity and that applies to your family. And the more you give, the more you get. And so don't pass up an opportunity that you might be given because you don't want to do the extra work that that position might call for. But back to Pike, it was it was huge and and so uh, one of my old sayings is action begets action. Meaning, if you take a step, you're going to get another step and another step and another step. So here I was, and I got into those positions of leadership within Pike. I uh, it, it allowed me to create um, uh, relationships that were a little bit beyond just um, having a good time and partying. And um, it, I got elected to one of the top honorary organizations at, at UT at the time, which was Texas Cowboys, and, and, and got admitted to the Texas Cowboys. And I got to then meet a whole different set of people because I, Texas Cowboys was populated with all the other fraternities, all the other social um, uh, and business fraternities, and, and it opened me to a totally different deal. So if I hadn't taken that one step, challenged myself just a little bit, I would never have, have gotten near, built near the relationships and the opportunities that I had because I did that one little thing. I was no different than all the other guys in the fraternity. Some liked to party more, some were more serious, but that's, that's huge. So I commend you guys right now for what you're doing at, at, in learning and, and leading your own chapters and don't stop because it will be really beneficial for you to keep pressing it. I'm going to bring up one thing at Pike that was, was not so good that um, it's not a big deal, but I had to speak in front of some organizations at, as, as Pike president. And I'm going to just tell you right now, I, 
completely gassed a speech. It was, it was embarrassing as hell. And um, so that's going to lead me to one of my other philosophies and, and principles is learn how to communicate. And, and even if you think you're a good communicator, don't stop there. Get a coach, go to Toastmasters, do whatever it takes, invest in yourself. And that made such a mark on me. I was so aghast at that. It made such a mark on me that I had to, I had to fix that. And, it, and by fixing that, it opened up a lot of opportunities. So I'm going off, off script a little bit. But um, so, um, so Pike was foundational. So let's, let's talk about graduating and um, inflection points in your life that you're going to have. Uh, that are that are that, that are you going to go left or are you going to go right? And and I had that right out of school because I had a job in Houston that actually was going to pay pretty well, and I could go back to Houston and I could be with all my buddies and I could be comfortable. And um, and then I had this situation thrown at me that I could go to London for work to work for this startup uh, reinsurance broker. And I didn't even know what reinsurance was, um, and get paid 7,500 pounds a year, $10,000 a year. And I'm thinking, oh my God. And my father, thank God, I, he was such a good mentor. He, he looked at me, he said, you know what? You get to make your own decisions now, you're a man, but you only live once and you can always come back to Houston. And I said, got it. So I ended up joining RK Carvel and it was a bunch of fire breathing entrepreneurs that had just left another brokerage firm and they were starting up their own shop. And here I was a young guy straight out of UT Pike, big time Charlie. And I was going, Oh my God. And, and so over three years, I got to see this happen and work. And I got to see how they treated people. I got to see how they called meetings and organized their teams and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and, I, was, and I got to be humbled uh, because I remember forget a week after I got there, they, they said, well, well, you know, what, what, you know what's your, what, what, your, what are you all about? And I said, well, you know, I was a Pike president and I got to be, you know, straw boss of the Texas Cowboys. And they were like, Oh yeah. Okay. Um, there's your desk right over there. And, uh, here's all your papers. And I was like, okay, I get the deal. What have you done for me today? And we don't care about where you came from. We don't care what you did. It's all about now. And, um, I, I, I will tell you, I know you're probably going, oh, that, that's a, that's not such a great story, but for me, it was a game changer because being in my, comfort zone of Texas and Houston, Texas and UT and attorney and all that sort of stuff. And then to go out and watch these guys trying to build a business was like a, a real shock to the system. And it, 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 it definitely taught me, Hey, you know what? People take risk all the time and here are these guys leaving and, and they're starting to kill it. Uh, and they're happy and people are having fun and they're motivating people. And so I said, I want a little bit of that. Now, next inflection point. So they offered me to stay on. They said, okay, John, you can stay. We're going to train you up. You're still a young kid. You don't know what you're doing. Um, and we're going to send you back to the States because we're going to open an office in the States and left or right. I went left, said right. Now I don't regret what I did, but 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 the but the but the end of that story is one of the young American guys that was with another broker that I met when I was working over there took my position. He trained with them. They moved him to Atlanta, and to 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 wrap it all up, he he they sold R.K. Carvel for $300 million and he retired at 50. And, um, and so not that it, money means everything, but it's not, it's not, it's not bad either uh, along the way. 
Uh, so I come back to Houston, Texas, and um, I started a, a, a Adams and Porter, and that was a a privately held partnership insurance broker in the marine energy space. And when I started there, it was it was clear to me I was competing with a number of other people to become a partner at Adams and Porter, and that's what you want to become as a partner. Um, mark that down. You always want to have equity in whatever you're doing. Keep that in the back of your head. Um, hard to get equity in a publicly traded company unless they give you a bunch of stock. But so I, I, I assessed the situation. I kind of used a little of my Pike experience and take a risk. I saw what these entrepreneurs were doing in London. And I'm sitting there and I'm competing with these folks to become partner. And what I, what I realized is they were all going to follow these other partners in tried and true marine business and some other things that Adams and Porter did a lot of. And I tried to figure out what do we not do a lot of? And we didn't do a lot of exploration and production business. And um, I said, I'm going to go start a team that does exploration and production business. Would that be okay? And they said, only if you're successful. And I said, well, we'll find out. And, and, and I, that's another principle. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the crowd. And so I employed two key principles of mine. And that is that you, um, that, uh, hard work is the great equalizer number one so i was going to outwork these other folks i was going to follow a different path i wasn't going to go with the lemmings i was going to take a risk and see if i could build something in revenue that wasn't being generated through this one that through exploration and production and i was going to invest in myself so that's i got a coach I, uh, I a speaking coach because i knew i needed to communicate better not only one-on-one -on -one, but through through with big groups or whatever it was huge i'm going to tell you if you don't take anything away from the day well i'm gonna give you two things make sure you're a good communicator i don't care if you become an engineer if you're an engineer and you communicate better than the other engineer you're going to get you're going to move so much further along if you're a banker or a lawyer i don't care what you do if if people I instantly gravitate to you because you're communicating in a way that they can understand or or you're friendly it's going to make a huge difference and that was something that i employed big time in my early days and i became a partner at 28 which was let me tell you um that was huge and it, it it's chance favors the well prepared is another one of my my uh sayings and uh, people just say well you got lucky well okay maybe i got lucky that uh, but i was prepared to get lucky and um, i always tell people the harder i work the luckier i get <laughs> and i'm telling you it's the truth but um unfortunately they walked into my office right after i really about six months after i got became partner in and uh said we were going to sell the business and and I, I knew enough to know at that time that we had something going and and I could have done very well in, in as a partner if we'd been able to grow it. But the senior partners obviously wanted to take the money off the table. And, and um, I guess it made it a little easier for me when he said, well, this is how much you're going to get. And I went, okay, I didn't plan on that. And, uh, but um, that's when I started by career at Adams and Porter and I, I, um, I not at, at Aon, it, you know, we became Aon essentially. And, um, I will say what I employed at, at Aon that worked unbelievably was goal setting. And, um, because we had very, uh, difficult tar you know, production targets and growth targets. And the only way that I knew how to really, um, manage the ability to actually um grow the business was to to set goals and um i will i'll say besides uh developing your communication skills if, if you're not a goal setter now 
And if uh, I, I suggest you start start that. And if you are a goal setter, I suggest you continue it through the rest of your life. And if you haven't read the books around goal setting, I suggest you do it because I will tell you, I kept diaries of all the goals I'd set each year. And it's amazing. I'd go back in these diaries and I'd see the goals that we set. I don't care if it was revenue production or specific accounts that we wanted to go after or, 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 or that we wanted to set up a new um, uh, uh, different type of you know, sexual operation within our business. And I'd go and look and see four, three years later, they magically happened. And so um, for those that have read any goal setting books, you know that it becomes part of your subconscious. You think about it all the time. And every day, even though you might not be thinking directly about it, you're doing the things that you need to do to get to that goal. And that's why you have to goal set in the right way. So I don't mean to be belabor goal setting, but for a sim simpleton like me that wasn't smart, I had to work hard, I had to, I had to goal set. And, uh, and, and that's a, that's a, a, a huge, huge thing. But thankfully, um, I got tired of the bureaucracy of the, of the publicly traded company. It did, you had no flexibility. There was a limitation on how much money you could make. And um, if you have an entrepreneurial bone in your body, if you're driven by, I want to be rewarded for what I do, um, you need to, you need to, 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 to really think about your, your progression and where you want to go, because I can tell you, you can get trapped into situations um, in some of the bigger companies and, and, uh, and they're great companies, but, but, but that's not, in my opinion, the way, the way to go. But so Lockton came along and, um, and here I was, you know, a grand poop at Aon, and, um, and, and I was offered the opportunity to start this energy team. And um, it wasn't as easy as I thought, that decision, because I had a lot of stock grants, and a lot of vested financial interests, and it was a lot of risk because I was probably going to get sued. And so it was the biggest inflection point in my life. And if I'd not had all the other inflection points that I really sort of internalized, I probably may have not made the, the right decision, but I, I decided, look, all of the things that I have done and learned from Pike, pivoting to London, making a bad decision about not staying in London, coming back to Adams and Porter, realizing that I could apply, work hard and smart, and, and I, will, I will be rewarded properly then seeing the buyout and how much money people made, not me, but others in the buyout, and then going to Aon. And, and it, it actually was an education because I, I saw what I didn't want. And then magically this Lockton, who is a fantastic privately held company out of, uh, out of uh, Kansas City, came and said, okay, we want you to build an energy practice. And I said, okay, I think my life's lessons have put me in a position to do that. Let's go bet on myself and um, gave back all the stock options. It was, you know, it was, it was all in. I mean, and that's sometimes the risk you got to take when you're, when you're in business um, and, uh, and not, not necessarily just business, but in other in endeavors too. Um, and, and thankfully it, it worked out well, but the one thing that was huge that I learned, and I wasn't a great leader until I got to Lockton, uh, it, it's a lot harder to, to, to lead people when you're starting things up because they have to really, really believe in you and, and, and you have to, to ensure that you have their interests at heart. And so you have to surround yourself with good people and you have to then invest in them because if they're successful, you're going to be successful, and and leaders are you really um, backed by those you know their employees, and it and and I, it took me a while to to learn that, but 
it, uh, I, I now are, am always trying to surround myself with, with really good people. And, and I like to shed folks that create brain damage or, or, or negative or, or, um, not wanting to try to move forward. Uh, I want to be around people that are, that are trying to drive, you know, drive forward and, and, and not, not in a bad way, but, but really create energy that uplift you. And leadership is a lot about leading by example too. I mean, you, you, um, it's not like, uh, uh, do what I say and, uh, not what I do. Uh, you gotta, you gotta be out, out front of, of, of them and they need to see that you're, you're taking the bullets too, as, as, as really you're taking the bullets for them and letting them go, go about their, you know, their job. Um, and so I'm now, I'm now uh, in a, a fairly reflective part of my life. Uh, I call it the fourth quarter. Um, and uh, I have no interest in, in giving up what I do because it's so much fun, but uh, I'm now into the mentoring stage and, um, and the true give back stage. Uh, and I, I don't wanna leave this without saying that the, if, if you all probably, if you didn't know Better Mew and you didn't know our chapter house, it was probably would be voted the worst chapter house in all the United States, um, seriously. And it, it hurt us bad and, and there were two big things. No one wanted to step up and it was gonna take too much time and effort to raise the kind of money that we needed to raise. And, and I found myself in the same sort of position. Well, if, if you don't, if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. I mean, there was no one that really, and we all talked about, we needed a new chapter house because Pi Kappa Alpha was a critical part of, of a lot of our lives. And, and so you got to give back. If you're successful in your life, you've got to give back. And I know a lot of you will be very successful. And that was a, a small way of giving back. But I will tell you this, the alumni I met that I got to meet through the fundraising process was the coolest experience. And my re-engagement with the classes, you know, a few years before, you know, ahead of me, and, and behind me was, I've made a lot more deep seated friendships and, um, you know, the richness of life sort of was exposed with those meetings. I met a lot of old pikes, people came out of the woodwork. So um, remember, pike will be with you for, for your entire life. If you, if you treat it well, it, it uh, the relationships you build will, will will last until the day you you know you decide that's it and um i have very rich friendships that i that i am reinvesting in all the time which is a which is a huge deal but so with all that being said i'm i'm ready to dive into any questions um kind of talk about what's going on in the business world right now what are some of the key issues anything that would be helpful to you all in, uh, in your, in your deciding how you want to pursue your career. John, thanks so much for sharing that story. Um, it, it was great to hear that and hear how those uh, principles help guide you through certain situations in your life. I love the, the life, the left or the right, which one are you going to take? And, um, we did have one question come in, uh, couple other funny remarks, but uh, one individual asked, uh, did you have a mentor that guided you through a career? If so, how did you find one? That's a, that's, that is a great question. And, and I tell young people all the time that people that are looking for jobs, um, I tell them, you need to find a place where you've got someone that's going to mentor you and take you and, and help you. Uh, and if you can't find that place, be very careful. So yes, at Lockton, we, uh, we assign uh, every new associate at least one mentor. So I'm mentoring two associates right now. And um, because it, it's, it's critical, it's, it's critical to their success 
because for us as an organization, our philosophy is we want someone up and running and being value added as quickly as possible. And if you don't mentor them and help them and guide them, you're, you're just, you're wasting an asset. And so the answer to that is yes, be very careful whatever you do to try to steer yourself into a situation where you, where you, you can have a mentor that you trust if it's, if it's at all possible. Great, great question. Uh, another one is, uh, what is your constructive stress relief? Uh, my stress relief is, um, I am a big workout guy. I got a Peloton bike back there. Um, gets into my philosophy. You can't run hard unless you're in good shape. Don't let your, don't let your body get in, in bad shape. And, and, um, and so that is my stress relief. It is, it puts you in a totally different mental frame of mind. And, and, um, and, it, and as you get older, your your uh, high intensity workouts, I I could tell you as an older person, you won't you don't age as fast. I mean, I got guys my age, they look like grandpa, and I I'm around them all the time, and I'm going, God dang, you're getting a, to be an old man, and um, I'm 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 64, but I mean I I I, I attribute it to not drinking too much, um, eating well, and cranking. And that's, that's the way I get through, you know, all the travel I used to do and all that sort of stuff. Come on with the questions. Let's, that's great. let's hey, get I'm, into this. I'm coming. I got it right now. Keep them rolling, guys. <laughs> so uh, uh, with this past year in the pandemic, uh, what a couple of new habits were you forced to develop uh, that you see continuing even once things go back to quote unquote normal? Uh, for Lockton, I see that we will have about 20% of our workforce working from home, mainly non client facing personnel. Um, I think we've learned that we can have a zoom meeting that's very effective and, and very engaging uh, without having to travel across the United States. So Lockton handles a lot of uh, clients and clients all over the United States. And, and normally if you had a, like a renewal meeting, you would fly to Philadelphia, you'd fly to wherever. And, and I think what we can do is we can have a meeting where they're, where, where they'd be just as happy uh, and, and, and not have to get, have the wear and tear and all the issues of, of, of flying. Now, with that being said, if you're in a business where, where personal interaction is necessary, and I am, I, I don't think you can, you, can, you can do everything virtual. But there's no question there's going to be a certain amount of the workforce that's not going back to the office. So we're going to have to redo how we do our office configuration. I know a lot of companies now, I spoke to one yesterday, um, they're hot desking meaning you don't have an office to yourself. You have a port you punch into and you go in, they assign you 301 today and 402 or tomorrow. And uh, that's, what, that's what a lot of companies are doing. I don't think Lockton's gonna do that because that's not quite our, our you know, a philosophy toward things, but that, there's gonna be a definite change there. Great. Uh, one individual asked, how do you, how did you refine your communication skills? Uh, they asked, can you explain what the coach you were referring to? And I believe you were talking about Toastmasters, but. Yeah, Toastmasters is an inter international organization and they have chapters all over different cities and it is a very structured uh, speaking organization that, that goes through these manuals um, and it, it's, 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 when you look at it, you go, oh my God, but I'm going to tell you when you come out of it, you will be so much more confident, so much more confident. You will, you will want to go speak to people. You will want to be in front of a crowd and, and it, it's huge. And 
what you've got to get over is some of the chapters are a little squirrely. So you got to find a good chapter. And, and you, sometimes you're around people that just are career speaking nerds, but, but they challenge you, they correct you. There's, it, it, it goes through all of, all of it. I'm, and, and then there's coaches that help you with, your speaking and your presence and that type of thing that you can get. And a lot of folks in our business have professional coaches and they, they help them in a lot of different ways as they develop in their careers. Normally someone starting out like you all wouldn't get a professional coach, but, but that's a, that's a big business these days. And I've seen some people really transform themselves. I, I, I used it more for, for speaking, but there are a lot of other organizations, but I'm just telling you, whatever it takes, you need to do that. You'll be amazed at, at just your confidence in walking into a room, your, your body language, your, the way you look, how you will be so much sharper. People will go, man, he's ready to go. And I tell you, that's what you want. You want presence. I hope that helped. <laughs> I, I can't look you in the eyes. So I don't know. I, I thought that. Dang, it's killing uh, me. We've had we've had about nine more questions flow. No, um, I, I've got all afternoon. If you guys don't want to go anywhere, uh, two of them relate to um, mentoring. So an individual asks, uh, "How easy is it to find a Pike alumni that can mentor me right out of my college for my career, and how do I get in contact with them?" Any, any kind of tips? Well, that's, well, that's, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and I think Pike's ought to set up a mentorship. I'd mentor people if, if they, if they wanted to be mentored, I'm mentoring, I'm mentoring uh, students at St. Thomas high school. And, 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 and so the answer to that is, I don't know, we don't have that set up yet, but that's a, that's a good, that's a good thing to do. Uh, because if you can reach out to people, you got your, your own parents, but it takes the village to, and, and sometimes you hear things differently from someone that's not your parent or someone that will just shoot straight with you. And, and we have professional mentors in Lockton too, that some of our younger people can call and say, I've had this situation. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know how to deal with a client and they will mentor them through through that and uh but that's locked in so mentoring is 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 huge and i think that's a great question i think we ought to be thinking about that couldn't agree more uh we have one individual uh reaching out he's going into the education field to be a teacher he says some days he feels like he's going to be the best teacher out there and other days he feels like it, it's going to be much tougher uh, do you have any advice for him from a personal mindset standpoint you know, you've got to follow your passions. Um, if you find something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And, um, you know, I, if, if you're having reservations, I don't know, that's a, that's a tough one. It's a noble, noble field. I'm going to just tell you that right now and forget all the money talk. We need teachers. We need teachers that are dedicated to teaching. We need to pay our teachers more money, frankly. But um, I, don't, I don't know the conflict. I, I, so it's hard for me to, to advise over this, but I would say you, you've got to be committed 100% to it. And, and no question, it's going to be challenging. And, 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 and I, anecdotally, I came that close. I got to close my fingers a little bit from quitting the insurance business. It's because I saw everybody else out there doing all these fun things, and here I was grinding away. And you just gotta stick stick with it. But but I, you know, you you, you probably you probably just gonna have to think about that one. We have a uh, sergeant at arms uh, in the chat, and they're asking uh, how do you, how would you go about handling situations with compassion but still firm? I'm assuming with dealing with chapter brothers. Uh, in, in certain situations, handling situations with compassion, but still firm. Well, I think, I think in business and in life, you, and, and just like with your kids, um, you have to, if, if, if there's an issue, you have to address it 
pretty directly. Um, and, a, and, a, and a lot of a lot of dealing with difficult situations is 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 not what you say; it's how you say it and how you set it up. But there's no question that you've got to be very firm about a violation or whatever it might be. But understanding to maybe the situation, I don't know what the situation was. And there's an art there's an art to it. And 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 frankly, early on, I was no good at it. I had, I just pulled into it and, um, I've, I've learned, I've learned that you have to, um, you have to think about what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. And, um, and you're, you're, you just have to sort of try to diffuse what might be a, a tense situation, but you can't back down from the black and white. And that is you have to deal with it. And if they, <clears throat> they take it hard, that's their response. And I always say it's not what happens to you; it's how you respond. And if you want to respond badly, then you're 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 you know it's it makes the situation that much more difficult. But um, number one, go in knowing that you got to deal with it. Number two, uh, prepare yourself for 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 the different ways they might react to it and how you might diffuse it a little bit. That was great. Uh, we've had a couple of people begin asking, what are some uh, books that you recommend, whether they're business books or just any books and book in general? Well, you know, uh, my, my feeble mind, I don't have the books right off the top of my head, but I read a lot of, I've read a lot of books. Um, I was a, and I used to listen to tapes, self-help tapes all the time. And it, it's just like the today. I just wanted to be able to leave whatever I was reading with one or two things that I was gonna write down and I was gonna internalize. So I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I, I don't have the, the, the goal setting books right, right with me in this, in my, this is my pool office. Um, but um, uh, if, if, if you were, if, if I will, uh, if Kate, Casey will send me a note and I'll send it out and I'll send you the ones that I think are, are relevant. Uh, yes, I will. Continuing on to that, some people are asking about your personal time management strategy and how you continually invest in yourself as well. Awesome, awesome. I I, I didn't get to that, and um, I think I think uh, one of mine was time is an asset. Don't waste it. And I, I see, I see people wasting time uh, pursuing things or, or, or doing things that are not moving the ball down the field. So I've always been careful with my time. And, and, and I think planning is a, a big thing. Going to bed at night with a plan, um, getting into a, 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 a habit of, of planning your day the night before don't go into the next day planning um, because days get out of control. So, and you have to, and when you're planning, and this is part of these, some of these self-help books, you have to understand what is a priority and what's not. And you, and you, and you have to disengage from the non-priority items. And I will tell in business, you have to get off the computer. You have to, and a lot of times you have to get away from the email and you have to get away from the distractions because it's, um, that's a big part of time management. And, um, and so I was, I've, I've been very disciplined in, in my, I keep a, a note a right here with all of my items I got to get done. And then I prioritize those items. And then I say, okay, I'm going to achieve these these are the most important things I've got to get done. And um, it, it, it creates time management. And then I'm very careful with my, my calendar and how I set up my day and where I set my priorities around. Because in my business, I've got to set a number of hours every day to, to new business opportunities. And if you, you, can, you, can, you can be very busy, but not creating value if you don't structure your day. And um, that's, a, that's a big deal. I don't know if I, 
help you much, but there's a lot of time management. Uh, and we actually have all of our young people go through time management skill, skill setting because they tend to just go off all over the place and, and end up and go, I'm so busy. And you're like, what did you do? Well, I only got this and that done. Well, hold on a minute. You didn't prioritize what you were doing. And so um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and if, you, if you don't prioritize and once you become successful, you will be, you will drive yourself crazy. It, 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 you won't know if you're coming or going, but also have help. I have an executive assistant who helps me. I've got other people. If I had to just rely on myself, I'd be probably a basket case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, what type of people slash teammates uh, do you find most helpful to surround yourself with uh, from your current role? I will tell you, at Lockton, we are looking for, number one, people that have initiative. Um, we're not looking for the MBAs or the smartest people in the room. We're looking for folks that are very driven. They have um, goals. They can articulate those goals well. And they have that, that it factor of, of initiative in, in, in doing things they're not asked to do. Where they see once they once they develop enough of an of, of 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 their knowledge that they can take something off of your desk that you never even asked them to take, they go in that morning and they say, "Look, I already did that. I knew you had to get that that uh, draft contract done or whatever it was." And so, I'm trying to surround myself with people that have initiative. They're yes people. They're not no people. Um, they're not Charlie Browns. Uh, oh, woe is me. It's they 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 want they want to learn they want to grow and they want to they want to go somewhere but they also recognize that they're not going to get there tomorrow it's going to take time uh because what i find in a lot of young people they want they want it now and that's fine if they can get it more power to them but i know in our business there's a, a certain amount of of just uh, dirty work that you got to put in before you're going to be creating any value. And, um, but once you start creating value, things start moving pretty quick. So again, we're looking for folks that have stamina, initiative, goal setting, and um, generally speak, speaking, a, a little bit brighter personality because in our business, we're in a people business. We're we're always dealing with clients, uh, and they and, and and we're no different than a restaurant. In a way, we serve we got we got to serve good meals all the time. If we serve one bad meal, then they're like, "Oh, I'm not coming back there." And I know it's I know that sounds simplistic, but that's the way it is. And so, you you build your business when you got clients that talk about you all the time. They God, have you done business with Lockton? They're the greatest people. And um, that's by having people that are getting the job done, upbeat, uh, call a client and say, no, let me take that off your desk. They call with a solution, not a problem. And, um, and if, if you can find ways to, 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 to do that, you're going to go places. I, I, come interview at Lockton, we'll hire you. Always recruiting. That's a true pike right there. Uh, one question is, uh, what led you to run for office in your in your Pike chapter, and what experience did you gain from it? I didn't hear the first thing. What's what that? led you to run for office uh, at Betamia, and what experience did you gain from it? Um, it was just I, I was sitting there and I saw, I, you know, it took me. And um, I decided, hey, I, I'm going to do that. It, like I said earlier in my talk, it's I made a decision and I thought maybe that would be good for me. I didn't realize how good it would be. 
Um, and what was the second one again? The uh, the second the second part of that. Um, uh, they are asking what uh, what did you learn from it? What experience? Oh, uh, I well, I, I I I learned a lot. I learned I, I, mainly I learned about myself. A that I could do it. B that I was pretty good at it. C that people wanted me to run for other offices and become president, which was kind of a political office at, at Pike Beta Mu. And, and so I learned that by taking office, you're, you're, you're taking on responsibility, but you're getting, you're getting a learning experience that other people aren't getting. So it's just like going to Toastmasters or anything else. You're taking initiative where others might be not be well you have to get voted in so you got to develop your your inner relationships with your with people so you're learning a lot of things and then when you get in you're learning how to how to handle that office you're learning how to deal with bands or buy booze or or set up you know caterers for you know social events you're at president you're learning how to run meetings and all the stuff you're learning and you're you get out of there and the people that didn't do it didn't learn any of that stuff and so you, you just have, you just have more skill sets from those endeavors. That's why anything that you get an opportunity to possibly do that you have time to do that you might think might be good for your development, you ought to take a jump at it. Love it. And you kind of answered this, but more poignant is uh, any advice on how to force yourself out of your comfort zone even more? Well, it's interesting you say that um, because it's it's always challenging to force yourself out of your comfort zone, and um, and 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 you've just got to start to do it. I mean, you've got to take the first step, and once you take the first step, it's not as scary as it as you thought. And even if you take the first step and it just is you fumble totally in whatever it might be you learn something from that. And so um, I, I actually have a situation where I, I'm being challenged to do something that, that is way out of my comfort zone and I'm grappling with it. So you, it doesn't, it never goes away. <laughs> it's just different situations. In this case, it's a charity situation, but it's, 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 it, it would, it would, it would stretch, it would stretch me. And, but, um, I think it's just like anything you do, you've got to take that first step and you've got to get out of it because what happens when you do is you become so much better. It, 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 so that it, it kind of, it sharpens you like a little bit of a knife. I mean, part of it's painful, but, but you come out of it and you go, man, I learn a lot. It's like Toastmasters. I've sent some young guys to Toastmasters and they just like got that manual and they looked at it and they were like, this is, why did I got to go through 12 sessions, vocal variety, facial expressions? I'm not doing that. I, you know, if this is going to take my nights or weekends, okay, your choice. You either do it or you don't. I tell young guys all the time, you know, I, I, all I'm going to do is tell you what I think. And if you don't want to do it, that's up to you. Uh, and, and sometimes maybe my advice may be bad, but I, the point is, if you want to get better at yourself, you've got to do some of these things. you got to push. Yes, we do. And uh, that was that was a great answer there, John. And we're, we're nearing the end of our time here, but um, I know we wanted to talk about one specific question that we had mentioned beforehand. And uh, <laughs> individuals want to stay on, stay on for this question. If you want to follow up to the next uh, session, please feel free to do so. But um, John, what do you believe is the most critical challenge students face entering the workforce today? Well, yeah, here's what I'd say to that. I think, I think, I think, the challenges that were well, besides COVID, okay, that's a challenge. Uh, that it, businesses are evolving. Uh, what what I was living in a world where for 20, 30 years it was sort of the same. 
banking was the same, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, now everything's moving quick. I mean, our, our business is being disrupted by technology. Um, talking about doing, trying to eliminate brokers and just go on to a online, you know, insurance buying, you know, form. Um, and so I think the challenging thing is, is putting yourself in a position where you, you can, you, you can pivot pretty quickly and, um, um, or, 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 or get into a space where you really understand what's going to go on in five years. Um, but I think the most challenging thing is finding what you really want to do. And I think that's hard to do coming out of school. I didn't know. I just got lucky. Okay. I was just lucky. And that's a, that's a challenge. And then you got to understand it well so that you, you can really figure out how you're going to go after it. Um, but you got to be flexible because things are changing quickly. And that, I think that's a big challenge coming out right now is how quick um, everything, all businesses are, are changing and how they're adjusting their hiring and that type of thing. Probably not a very good answer to, to the question, but uh, it's, a, it's very fluid right now in, in the business world. Maybe the question wasn't direct enough either. I thought it was a great answer, but um, I, you know, we, we've had some people fall off. Um, we were up stored about 180. We're about 90 right now. So well, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to be guided by you all, whatever I'm, well, all I'm going to do is go have a glass of wine after this. So good. Um, you know, if it's 15 minutes later, that's okay too, but we, uh, it seems like we've reached the end. We've had a lot of people fall off and they've had, Oh, that's they're, fine. That's they're going fine. The last session, but, John, I just wanted to thank you so much on behalf of PiCap Alpha, the foundation and Pike University. Um, you've been fantastic at this. And in the not so distant future, fingers crossed, we're gonna have to bring you back to be able to uh, speak in front of a lot of people. Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, if that, if that, if that happens, that's great. It's a, it's, it's a it's super organization and I'm a, I wanna support as much as I can. So Samuel and Casey, it's been real. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat right now too from people. You tell you tell those guys if they need any help, let me know. For sure, John. All right. Thank you. All right, I'm signing off. Good. Yes, sir. Right. Thank Take you, care. John. Thank All you. All right, see y'all later. Bye.